I'm in a part of the country that hasn't been hit too hard, at least my particular county, but it's only a matter of time. So everyone out there, stay safe. You have nothing better to do than sit inside and watch us talk nonsense about wrestling. So do it. Exactly. Yeah, this is the only time we're staying indoors and doing nothing is how you can save the world. So do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, just do it. And the, 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 quicker, the quicker this is over, the better. But for the time being, it is what it is. Like, that's why I, I really like that we had a WrestleMania this year because it actually gave us something to talk about and kind of t- took my mind off it for those six hours. Um, it was kind of weird to just sit there and watch wrestling, right? Even though some would say it's not wrestling. And we will talk about that because <laughs> so much to talk about. It is it is insane. It was weird to watch without other people. I don't know if other people often watch it in parties, but I mean, I've been watching since WrestleMania 20 with the same, at least a couple of the same friends. Um, we did a chat, you know, a, a Zoom chat. I know other people did Skype chats, but not the same. No. Not the same. No, no I, we used to watch wrestling as a, a group as well, but then, you know, life happened and it got kind of difficult <clears throat> to do that. But like in the US, you guys watch wrestling wrestling like normal people during the day over here oh, it's a night event right so you can't really do that you know you, you can't just decide to stay up to four o'clock in the morning when you have work the next day or whatever um but yeah that's that's the disconnect but yeah it, it would be weird but again like a lot of what you guys deal with sometimes where it's weird for you it's like oh welcome to how the uk and ireland watches wrestling <laughs> in the middle of the night like a hermit you know that's it's not, actually one of the weirdest experience for me as an Irish person, was watching Raw and SmackDown in San Francisco during the day at like four o'clock. Um, were you you were you at that WrestleMania, or you were just at home in Ireland and it was c- complete daylight at Levi's Stadium? No, no, this was just uh, this was just a um, random Raw last year when I was in San oh, okay. Francisco for work, and I was just watching Raw, and I'm like, oh, it's four o'clock in the day. This is weird. <laughs> yeah. Usually it's one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, it's just it feels strange. It's very um, odd. Yeah, it's very odd. I think the closest thing that would happen for you guys is when they did that East and the East show. Yes. And that's probably the the closest I can put to what, what watching wrestling is like over here, you know? But that's why, so, you know, not watching wrestling with people is, is not a huge deal for me now, but it's still kind of weird. You know, like, I, I, was, I was watching my parents were in the room and stuff like that, and they were like, a lot of moaning, and it was very awkward. When you're watching <laughs> the women in particular, and it's just you're just orgasming, orgasming. <laughs> it sounds like you know the same thing, and you're just like, okay, can, can you can you just not moan a little bit? You know, it's it's creepy. I've always felt the same way with women's tennis. I don't I don't know why these sounds are made. Yeah, it just it's what's it's what happens. Um, but overall, I thought like I, I can't believe the whole time. Touch I was my thinking, face. <laughs> yeah, I don't touch your face. <laughs> don't touch my face. No, touch your face. Uh, I don't. I, we're indoors though, so it's not like I can touch your face. Whatever hurts. <laughs> I watched Contagion recently, and I was just like, creepy how awkward this is. But anyway, we're not. We're not that kind of podcast. Uh, yeah, we're here to talk wrestling, right? <laughs> you're in the chat. What are your conspiracy theories? <laughs> oh God. No, oh, no. But um, yeah, like, I, for, first thing to talk about, right? I liked the way it was two days. I like that for uh, this was a much better way for me to watch wrestling as a because nine hour WrestleMania, oh, it's too much. What do you think? Hope and thoughts on this. I completely agree, and I, I'm going to belabor that a little bit further because what my friends have been doing for the past, I guess it's now three years, for this one is we've been watching NXT Takeover in the afternoon, then jumping into the pre-show, then watching the six hours of WrestleMania. Oh. By the end of it, we're just like. This is terrible. And I think the biggest example, if you can't tell from my virtual background, I'm an AJ Styles fan, people. Um, I think the location. <laughs> I'm on location in, in AJ Styles' mind. <laughs> um, but I think the greatest example of that was AJ Styles versus Shinsuke Nakamura at WrestleMania. Yeah. It was just at a time when the crowd was so burnt out. Yeah, exactly. Was the match good? It might have been, but there was no energy to be had. So I think this was much better. I agree with you. Also... With the empty, yeah, I got you. We'll, we have to get adjusted to the weird yeah, delay. Um, 
with the two days being separate, Saturday night gave us a chance to get acclimated to what WrestleMania would feel like with no crowd. And by Sunday night, I was bought in. Yeah. So I felt like it was a stronger show. I don't know if it actually was, but I think I was more acclimated to that type of environment. I thought the first night was better. And I think they did that on purpose to kind of get people, as you said, used to it. And then by the second night, you're like, okay, this, this is how it is. And then you were kind of, they were able to do like slower matches. I thought that was really clever. Um, but I, I don't know if you were watching the empty arena show SmackDown and Raw's leading, leading up to it. Um, because, you know, it, the first night was weird and then you're kind of like, right, this is just how it is. So it was less of an adjustment for me personally, but, um, it was still very strange. Still very strange to see. Watch snippets, but I couldn't find myself getting too much into it. The I, they, they needed time to figure out how to make it work. I, I think. think. Yeah, and I think they did. I think it was one of those kind of things where they knew, right? We have to get this to a certain level, so it doesn't look like a performance center. You know, if that, and that's not a knock at a performance center, but you know, it's not WrestleMania for a lot of people. It's not Raw or SmackDown for a lot of people. But one of the things that I've seen online, and I think it's very unfair, is people saying, "Oh, this wasn't WrestleMania." And it's like, well, what was it? You know, it's like, oh, well, it, was, it didn't have the spectacle. I'm like, Shh, you got two of the craziest matches in history. Yeah. And people will be talking about it for generations. If that's not WrestleMania, then I don't know what is. WrestleMania, for me, going into this show, I will agree with them that that was my number one concern. I feel like the spectacle is what draws you in. It's the, yeah, exactly. I'm a pyro guy. I love seeing the fireworks and all the craziness. Mm. But... What it really is, is those WrestleMania moments that you remember. Uh, Kevin Owens jumping off of the sign and literally saying, how's this for a WrestleMania moment? And then obviously the two matches that you alluded to are ones we will be talking about forever. So, I mean, how, how can you complain when, at a time when there is no other cohesive live entertainment? I, I give it up to the WWE. They, they practice every safe protocol that they possibly could they sent superstars home that were sick or they yeah. felt shouldn't be there i mean this is our world right now and none of us like it and we're making the best of it exactly like look i i will understand i understand that it didn't have a lot of the same punch for example when um you know the becky lynch match suffered from it greatly uh the drew mcintyre match i felt so sorry for drew um mm. because, you know those kind of moments yeah i'll give you that they didn't have any kind of impact. And that uh, Goldberg uh, Strowman match was horrific. It was all going to be horrific. It was over before it started. Yeah, it just, at least he didn't give himself a concussion, which was you know, <laughs> good. But uh, yeah, like watching this, watching those matches, which was just straight wrestling matches, I think that was a bad idea. You know, doing, and they knew that. They were like, look, we have to have a few of these. And I think that's why when it went with The Undertaker and went with um, Bray Wyatt, they're like, well, we know this is going to be bad, so why don't we just give them something different? And I think that was really clever because we got the best of what people wanted, right? Which is like, you had your wrestling matches and they were flat, and then we had something completely different. And it wasn't. Like, look, my thing is, would AJ Styles versus The Undertaker? I'm going to start there. Would AJ Styles and Undertaker have been better as a straight wrestling match? Do you think? My heart wants to say yes. But I think I'm still in that afterglow of what I saw. Yeah. And it was so unique that I don't know if it would have stood out from the rest of the matches as much. I mean, yeah, can we just focus on the fact that AJ Styles got to main event a night of WrestleMania? That's a reality. Not only that, AJ Styles in a Jeremy Borash produced segment. Yes. Right? Yes. Talk which, about an impact. Which is like, wow, this is huge, right? And it, it, it really felt like, for the first time in years, it felt like a WrestleMania main event. Even though it was so far away from what we thought a WrestleMania event, main event should be, that it's a game changer. And it is one of those kind of massive moments. I think they could have had a great singles match. I do think that both those guys could have pulled it out, but AJ would have had to do a lot of covering for the taker. Absolutely. I mean, we've seen that in his recent matches. And, oh, I hate even to say this, but AJ doesn't even have the same hop in his step that he did in 2017. No. So I, I, I like this. I just, it was so unique. It was so different. Everybody knew 
there were there were rumors, oh, they're using a different set. They're doing something different. But having background music, and I, I know you must have been going crazy for the Metallica. Oh, man, um, I loved it. I loved the it. Amer- the Amer- yeah. American actually, Badass back. Oh. For the first bit of it, I was like, wait, is that Metallica? That's weird. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, cool, we're in, you know? It was, it was completely, from, from the get-go, it was just completely just changing what we thought was going to happen, which for the first time, we don't get that, right? Usually uh, the big complaint is, oh, WWE don't want to take risks. They do the same thing over and over again. And it's like, now this is, for the first time, it's like, well, they're really trying. They're really pushing the boat out here. They had to. I mean, the amount, oh, don't touch my face. The amount of revenue uh, lost by, <laughs> the amount of revenue the company lost uh, by not having that live gate, by not having all their vendors, the WWE access, all of that. Uh, you got to compensate with that somehow. And having it in a small arena is really the only viable option, uh, not just for safety, but for somehow managing the bottom line during what is generally the strongest quarters earning for the company. Yeah. Hopefully there was a boost to the to the network. I'm not sure. Um, we'll have to just have to wait and see, but... I don't know what they could have done differently. There were only a handful of matches that I didn't enjoy. Yeah, like, you know, the, the straight wrestling matches were the weak point. Yeah. Um, and the big WrestleMania moments weren't there. Like, again, I was watching Drew, and I'm like, this is so sad. This is so sad because, you know, I've been following his career for years. Um, you know, obviously, over this part of the world, it's huge as well. And it's just, it didn't have that feeling. But again, it was just like, well, what could they have done? You know, I thought the ladder match was really decent, even though that was inside an empty arena. Um, I think a lot of the matches, they use the empty arena stuff to their advantage as well. And I would even say that WWE, they've been given a couple of things here which they could do. They could do yeah. an empty arena show every year, like just as a show, which would be kind of cool, which is on the table now. And- I, I, it's definitely on the table now if it wasn't oh, yeah. before. And before we jump past that ladder match, yeah, sure. I got to point something out, and that is, the amount of adrenaline and crowd rush that you get yeah. from an audience is really what gets you through these matches. Um, I could relate it to a stand-up comedian. You have to feed off your laughs and stuff that you get from the crowd. Or I'm a juggler, and you know you got to feed off of what that is. Uh, for a wrestler, to throw yourself through steel objects or wood painted to look like steel, whatever. <laughs> to throw yourself through steel objects without that adrenaline rush that you're getting from that support. I mean, I, I take my hats off to that guy. It, it, all, of, all three of them really went out of their way. They did some unique stuff and really just in a tiny little arena for Rob Gronkowski and the biggest push of his life, Mojo, Mojo Raleigh. I mean, yeah, it was, it was amazing. It, it was just like, you know, fair play guys. I can only imagine what this is like. It's, you know, as he said, you know, you're a juggler, I play gigs. You know, you can probably both play shows in front of, like, two people. It's not the same. <laughs> yeah. You're playing in front of, like, 100, 200, 300 people. It's totally different. But uh, we have a question in the chat, actually. Dave, who are your three favorite superstars of all time? Of all time? Yeah. Oh, my know, goodness. Why wow, I put on the spot. Yeah, right. Shout That's out to you. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I AJ Styles. Yeah, that's good. Um... <laughs> Gosh, uh, probably Cena. Always been a big Cena mark. That was certainly reignited last night. Um, I, I marked out a fair bit actually as well. I forgot to describe it. And uh, oh, I mean, God, Paul London. Unique choices, Dave. Unique choices. Paul London. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go with uh, Punk, even though what he did. Uh, you know, like grassing out with best friends is just not good. Um, Taker, because obviously it's going to be Taker and Triple H, because everyone knows I love Triple H, and that's you know, that's just it, right? You know what? I'm gonna ah, oh, you bring up a good point. I have to substitute in just because I watched him in the gym from day one. I'm gonna substitute in the love of my life, Paul London, for Ricochet, um, because. Yeah, he's a guy that, he's my age. I used to go and see he's local to my area. I used to see him wrestle in front of 20 people when he was scrawny, didn't have all these muscles. Um, so I think it's been unique following his journey 
and I relate to him in that way. Uh, I've had opportunities to talk with him at those shows, and, and that was cool. London's, you know, he made his choices in life, but as I guess if I'm talking about as a wrestler, I, I have to put Ricochet a little higher up there. So basically, I like small flippy guys, and also John Cena. <laughs> yeah, I, I like gimmick wrestlers and workers, which is also why Finn Balor is, is on is close on that list. Now, at the moment, Finn Balor and Alistair Black would be the three guys who I would be like, yeah, I'm in, I'm in 100%. Um, but yeah, great question. Thanks so much. We appreciate Thank you. It. Um, yeah, but look, ladder matches at WrestleMania, they're one of the things that I I love seeing. You know, if, if there's not a ladder match at WrestleMania, I feel disappointed. And the fact that they did one here, even when the world is ending, it's like, well, fair play. You know, you, you, you brought out a WrestleMania staple. So, fair play to those guys. Um, because the first the first ladder match was at WrestleMania, right? That was the Shawn Michaels uh, Razor Remote match? The first WWE ladder match, I think. Well, yes. Yeah. Yes, I know Bret Hart has contentions about that. Yeah, he does. And he lets people know. Hey, yes, he does. He lets people know about it. Um, were you happy with the results? I know some people were kind of disappointed that I was kind of gimmicky, but... I was happy enough with the, with the retention from Morrison. Yeah, because after what they did to him at the Royal Rumble, mm. where he basically came in, got obliterated by Brock Lesnar, and that was it. That was his big return. Uh, yeah, I thought he might be punished for The Miz showing up sick, but luckily he was not. Oh, excuse me. Are we in kayfabe? Miz was injured. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, how can you be upset with that? I don't. Look, I don't know. I was. I was surprised that he retained, but I think it was just because you know who else are they going to give it to? You know, they're not going to give it to the Usos. It's too early. Um, and the New Day, they want. You know, what are they going to be able to do with New Day that they haven't already done? I think it makes more sense to keep them on. Yeah, it's fresher. Gives them a bit more legitimacy. Keeps the Miz relevant with his TV show. Smart business decision. What were you uh, on night one as well? Uh, this was followed up by Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins. I enjoyed the kind of hook line. Like I was on Twitter the whole time on this. People freaked out when the, when the disqualification happened. And I'm like, come on. I'm not going to do that. Like, guys, I'm working here. And then obviously you started no disqualification match. So, you know, I liked it. I thought it was a very unique way to do it. Um, some really good spots when the match got going. Whatever way they edited it, because obviously these were all pre-taped. Um, you know the shots from the from the weapons actually felt way more like legit than they normally would. Um, you think they the added NFL, sound effects? Sound effect. Oh, we both said the same thing. Effect. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering that. Yeah, there were a couple of points during the show where I was like, "Could I see a lot, a lot of so. this was edited?" And look, you know, it didn't take away from it. No, I mean wrestling. Yeah, it didn't take <laughs> away from it. I was just like, "This is fine." Yeah, I, I don't understand the complaints. I'm already suspending my disbelief that anybody has a chance to wrestle Brock Lesnar. So, I mean, well, what's the big deal if you added some sound effects or you do some kooky gimmick? I mean, that's the point. It's it's surrealism. It's an escape. It's it's art. It's it's performance art is what it is. I mean, come on, guys, go watch MMA if that's what you want. But yeah, this is our soap opera, and this is why we love it. Yeah. And, and actually... Sorry, to tail dove off of that, one of the things I did appreciate about all the matches there seemed to be at this year's WrestleMania is almost every one seemed to have a solid storyline. They may have just been thrown together in video packages for the night of WrestleMania, but they all had a cool story going into them, and that's something they haven't really done since the Attitude Era, and I appreciated that. See, that was the thing. This was more, this was less of a sport WrestleMania and more of like a, an event WrestleMania, which is, you know, again, for people who are, grew up on the action era like I did, or when I became prescient, that wrestling wasn't, was more of a, just than just a, what it was. Um, this has felt like an action era WrestleMania. So I understand what people are upset with it, and I understand a lot of it, but I'm also like, this is what you wanted. This is what people have complained about for a very long time. And the fact that we got these kind of work shoe angles, we got like heavy storylines. It was great. Like the only, as I said, when this show fell apart, it fell apart because they were straight wrestling matches in an empty arena, which just never works. And again, Braun Strowman versus Goldberg, case in point. Becky Lynch versus Shayna Baszler, completely. They were just, they were nothing. It just, they didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I'm saying. You know, if they wanted to do an empty arena match, again, what's the most famous empty arena match in WWE history? Rock and Mankind. That was pre yeah. edited, 
I don't like understood. Right. All except for that last yeah, camera but, angle. They followed that farmer out. That last camera yeah, angle of everything. the forklift coming down kind of ruined it. But other than that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But again, people were like, oh, it's, it's, it's real, you know, and you're like, no, it's, 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 it's entertainment. And, you know, again, I, I loved it. I think WDB is at its strongest when it is entertainment, but in a good way, you know, and I think solely by the need, WWE peaked on night one with, with that kind of mixture of entertainment and sport, right? Or sport element. And Undertaker versus say themselves, you know, this is how you do, like for years on our past shows, Dave, I think you know where I'm going with this, right? Um, we talked about loads of things. And one of the things that I always brought up was Sting versus The Undertaker. And there was always like, well, will Sting be able to go? I think this is how you do that. This is how you bring, not on the thing, but this is how you bring back guys who maybe aren't able to work a 15 minute match. But still have, you know, value or name value. This is how you protect them. It's the perfect way to do it. What do you think? I, I, it's, I think it's the only way to do it because I don't trust Sting or The Undertaker. Not, I mean, they're both incredible performers and they would never purposely put each other at harm but i mean age becomes a factor at some point and we saw what happened when seth fought sting it retired him because of that buckle bomb so yeah i think protecting them i mean th this is the first wrestlemania in how many where we didn't have to watch the undertaker get stretchered out or basically dragged out of the ring that, that's nice to know. I like suspending my disbelief, but I also don't want to watch people legitimately hurt. Yeah, like that's not what this is about. Like that's why wrestling was worked in the first place to be a form of entertainment that we can all enjoy, right? And suspend our disbelief. And, you know, this is how you keep the, like if the Undertaker wants to go and it doesn't look like he's going to retire anytime soon, um, this is how you do it. Every year, have some kind of work gimmick match where it's like this, you know? He has a match with Kane, has a match with, you know, The Rock or, you know, Hogan or whatever. You can literally dig up anyone you want and plug them in and it can work. You know, and I, you know, uh, this match with Sting can do it. And it also gives guys, sorry, it also gives guys like Cena, which we saw in the Firefly uh, Funhouse match, or The Rock. Guys who may be filming movies and part of their insurance contract says you can't be in a wrestling match because you can get hurt. We saw The Rock. I'm not going to say why his pectoral muscles got torn, but we all know what they're a side effect of. And so because of that, they're not allowed yep. to compete in matches. And this is a way to have them on the show participate in some form of a spectacle and get the best out of them. Sometimes great things rise from the darkest of times. Yeah, and I think that's... And look, WWE has been comfortable for so long, and that's one of the big criticisms of WWE, where they're like, hey, um, you know, they're sitting in passive mode. Now they have, like, what is a global pandemic? And they're, like, they have to adapt. And they've adapted in such a unique way where I know I didn't think it was possible. I didn't think we were going to get this. In my wildest dreams, I didn't think we were going to get this. And yeah, it was like some people said it's like a bad horror movie. That's good. <laughs> That's what wrestling is. It's yeah. scary and it's brilliant. And um, yeah, it was just a, a brilliant way to cap off WrestleMania. For the first time in 10 years, this felt like something that should be worthy of WrestleMania. You know, now I know some people were upset that there wasn't a crowd and it couldn't go. I know a lot of people who couldn't go to the show and had tickets, but you got a refund. The trade off. Worth it. I mean, what? Yeah. Like, what? Well, it's not like it was the know. WWE's decision. It was the government's decision. They said, you know, I mean, the WWE announced that they were canceling it, but had they not, the government was saying, "We're not going to allow you, you know, into this arena." I lost Derek, but hopefully, you can all still hear me. Yeah, we're about uh, So <laughs> the point. The point is that, you know, it's it, you got to make the best of it. I understand people being disappointed. Should we have postponed it? No. Make SummerSlam this great coming out 
a huge spectacle of everything you saved from WrestleMania. Why not? I mean, August is hopefully when we get our lives back to normal. I don't know. Obviously, we have listeners all around the world because you know, you're in Ireland. I'm on the East Coast in the U.S. We got people all over. So uh, this is at least going to last until June. Um, August, right around the corner from that, I hope we're back to our regular way of life. And, and let's let's celebrate that with the, you know, the grandest party of the summer, you know, whatever summer fest is called nowadays. Shout out, Jeremy. Yeah, exactly. Pittman. Like, you know, and it was just... <laughs> um, yeah, it, look, but even if we get this and just this, at least it is something that was worthwhile, right? Um, and again, open up a different thing. But, man, I don't know what's going to happen now after this. Like, there's two different tapings. So we have SmackDown, Raw, and NXT tape this week. After this week, I don't know what we're going to talk about next week, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Night 2... As you said, they set the table with with everything here, so we kind of knew what to expect. How do you think night two compared to night one? I think it goes back to what I said at the beginning. I was more acclimated to it, um, so I enjoyed it more. I don't necessarily know that the wrestling was better. Uh, I thought the end of the card was pretty much a major dud. I had the Street Profits match and the... Whatever match was after that one, it's now I'm blanking out. Oh, the Bailey match. Those two matches, they did nothing for me whatsoever. I, I like yeah, it was bad. I just I had to go back. I'm, I'm gonna be completely honest. I fell asleep. Had to go back and watch them this morning so that in case they came up, I could comment on them. And I woke up for the Firefly Funhouse match, and that brought me right back into it. So you know, it's uh, it was. I don't know what it was. I don't know if I was burnout or what but they just did not keep my attention at all at all and they were the straight wrestling matches like we talked about yeah i agree like that's the thing anything straight wrestling it 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 loses i think wrestling in the ring needs the crowd wrestling like you know that's it in the squared circle they need a crowd without the crowd it's just not gonna work um and it doesn't yeah, that, that's proven. So you do other things around it. I thought the last man standing match, they did the best they could. It was way too long. It was 20 minutes too long. You know, there was no reason for that to go 40 minutes. Really oh, wow. Long. That was uh, 40. Maybe that's why I was so burnt out. Yeah, that's, what next that's what happened. It was 40 minutes. And I was, oh, my gosh. I was watching it. And I'm like, why is this? And the worst part about it is that was pretty taped, edited, and they still did it. So people sat down and said, you know what we need? 40 minutes of this. They could have cut out an entire room or something. Yeah, I see what you're saying. But I will say that was one of my favorite matches of the night. I enjoyed it. It was it was reminded me of playing the old video games where you go into the back room areas and you actually get to utilize the objects. Um, and they did unique things. Like when you went to the conference room, I said this was an attitude error pay per view. That's what this was. Yeah, yeah. It really was, you know, when they used to, when, like, if stuff had been different, well, what would have happened, but if it had been different, they would have went down to the crowd or went to a bar, and it was just like, this is great, this is what, this is what, like, they did the attitude there, right? But, again, like, 40 minutes is 40 minutes. And that is long. That's why we were all kind of burned out. It's long, you know? Uh, like, I, I went up, went to the back room, came back, and the match was still on, I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay, and then I went back, well, no, then I went upstairs for a bit and came back down, I'm like, this match is still on. Like it's just what's going on. <laughs> it's still going. Because usually you expect it. It's still going, you know. But um, look, I, 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 another. Pro- I felt bad for Edge in the sense that he didn't get the pop. You know, he got a huge pop at the Rumble, though. Yeah, but as for a single match pop, you know, you don't get true. That back. So I did kind of feel bad for him there. But I mean, more than I don't know how bad I feel for them because they're still getting my money. I'm still paying them the wrestle, so I don't feel super duper bad that he didn't get a lot of cheers. I'm sure that's not going to make that big of a difference at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I will say, well, two things, because you mentioned something being long. And if we're talking about long, how about the size of that conference table in the performance center of all places? Why do they need a conference table that big? Right. (laughs) That was absurd. I, I I was thinking the same thing. (laughs) <laughs> I'm like, who are they? Who are they interviewing? Is are all the roster there at all times? Is that what's going on? That's what it felt like. 
Um, I wonder no, Vince is so intimidating. <laughs> yeah, but like, you know who's sitting there all the time? Triple H is sitting there. It's like, why do you need this? Like, this just seems ridiculous. But Absolutely. look, it worked. You know, I, I think a lot of that stuff could have just been added to pad stuff out a bit. But yeah, uh, if anything felt tacked on, that kind of felt tacked on. It felt like it wasn't like a real part of the performance of it. I did have to give props. Oh, sorry. I did have to give props to Edge, though, for his athletic ability. Some of those swinging dives that he did, I did not know he was capable of doing. Where he would, like, pull up on the handlebars. You know what I'm talking about? You might have been out. This might have been when you left the room. But, like, Orton would be laying down on a table, and he would, like, do, like, a pull up and swing his body back and forth and then fall down with all his weight, like, elbow drop. And that really impressed me. That's not a physically easy maneuver to pull yeah. off. So I thought Edge gave it his all. I think like Edge is in the best shape of his life now at like nearly fifty. So fair play. You know, that's that's great. You know, it seemed like he was really in and Randy Orton was great too. You know, Orton can be kind of fifty fifty, but he he really went out there and was like this is this is the match that we're gonna have and they did. It was it was very, very good. It was very, very decent. Um just very long. Very long and it burned out. I think, the, as you said, the matches after it, there was that kind of burnout that I definitely felt too while watching it. But, you know, small price to pay. Um, I think the right result happened though with the, the with the Street Profit match and also with the Women's uh, Championship. Uh, on the SmackDown Women's Championship, I was going to go see Bailey work out. But um, I think, Dave, we need to talk about what everyone is expecting to talk about. Which is Otis versus Dolph Ziggler. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, let's touch on that. That I, I did. worked out quite well. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> like, really, it was done very well. I, to, I wasn't expecting to enjoy that match as much as I was. Even on the build-up with the whole, I think they're bringing back Solomon Crow to the hacker gimmick that was like three years ago. Right, um, right. But yeah, look. That, that's... That, I saw ridiculous. Art- I saw a bunch of ridiculous articles actually online. One of them naming your boy Ricochet as like the hacker gimmick. I'm like, well, <laughs> that makes no sense. But uh, yeah, it looks like it's Solomon Crow that's coming back. But, um, well, he was a little skinny, but it could have been. Well, first of all, yeah. sorry for audience for subverting your expectations, uh, Ryan Johnson, Last Jedi style, because I know where you thought we were going with this topic, but I did want to talk about Otis. <laughs> Because I love the story. And it's been a while since we really got that wrestler fights another wrestler for the female manager love interest storyline, which I don't know, I guess in today's modern era, some people take as whatever. You you guys know what I mean. I don't need to spell it out. But I enjoyed it because it harkened back to, you know, Hogan and Macho Man and Miss Elizabeth and, and those types of things. And who wouldn't want to fight over Mandy, honestly? I mean, right? sign me up. Yeah, like, as I said, I said this this was an attitude error angle. Yeah. And I, I love, and I love Dolph. Said, Miss Elizabeth and stuff like that as well. Yeah, Dolph had, um, he screamed Bullet Club Young Bucks to me with his bandana, his mannerisms. I don't know if that was in playing towards that or whatever, but he definitely seemed to be going with that vibe, which I found very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Also, also one of the best people you can follow on Twitter, follow Dolph, nickname is on Twitter. It's absolutely hilarious. During WrestleMania, he just came out with some of the best one-liners of the whole <laughs> night. Like, I was just cracking up every time. But uh, yeah, it was it was definitely interesting. You know, he, he, he really doesn't like Goldberg. <laughs> he really does not like Goldberg. Um, like in real life, which is funny, but also, um, during this match, it was pretty insane to watch him three. But, uh, yeah, look, I really enjoyed this. I thought, um, the oldest thing they've been building up for months, it was one of the best build, uh, matches on the whole card. So to get that kind of path, but again, uh, him getting the girl, him getting, uh, Mandy, it would have been better with the crowd, but obviously it was what it was, you know, it's possible. Yeah. Alistair Black and Bobby Lashley, before we go, very disappointing because they did nothing and it, was, it gave Alistair a win and that was it. So, Yeah, I don't... How long have they been doing Bobby Lashley in pants? 
Is that been going on for a while and I haven't been paying attention? Yeah, or I, I think this I think this just happened, but Bobby Lashley's weird, man. Like it was I awful. Did interview with him. I did interview him a couple of years ago where he was the world champion in TNA and just talked about golf for 20 minutes. So <laughs> maybe he just... <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, he talked about nothing else but how much he loves golf. So maybe this is just the mood he was in when they were taping. It's a very odd look. I don't... I don't know. I don't know. It's very, very odd to me. A wrestler's chain. I, I, my question is, does he carry it on now? Is this just his thing? But I guess we'll find out during the next uh, SmackDown or Raw taping. Please don't. I'm waiting for him to come up. <laughs> Please don't. don't. I'm waiting for him to come... I'm waiting for him to come out as uh, the new Carolyn Carol White, you know, as, as his game, <laughs> where he's like, I just love golf. And it's like, yeah, this is just him. You know the way the Undertaker likes to be a biker, because that's just who he is in real life. And I think eventually when Bobby Lashley gets famous enough, he'll just be Carolyn White. But just be the golfer. I, just be the golfer, yeah. <laughs> so that's what he wants to do. Um, okay, well, let's actually talk about The Fiend versus John Cena. So hold on, before we talk about it, what was your expectation of this? I'll tell you, after watching the Boneyard match, I had very high expectations for this because now I knew, because this was the other match that I heard rumor was shot on a completely different set. And I said, okay, they're going to do something different. I thought it would take place in like the set of Bray Wyatt's house. No, this, this. Oh, it blew my mind. This was not a wrestling match. This was a psychology match. They took you through Every failing, um, every uh, self-esteem issue that John Cena has been through throughout his entire career from uh, debuting with the prototype gimmick and not really getting over to failing as a bodybuilder to his rap career not going well to not getting along with the fans when he returned. And then when he finally tried to embrace that and give in and say, no, I'm over this. And he takes a chair shot at Bray and he breaks character. That's when Bray wins. And I was just, I I was blown away by the psychology that went into it. I I loved it. Like they, they apparently shot this on the set of the uh, warehouse, the video warehouse, which explains why he had all the props. Yeah. Including the, including the SmackDown Fist, where once I thought, I was like, oh my god, the SmackDown Fist, this is fantastic. Um, but yeah, like I think this it wasn't a wrestling match in your traditional sense. As you said, this was the closest thing to perform in dark that I've ever seen in wrestling. And it had everything. Like, it had your... It had callbacks, um, fan nods, but also just... It was interesting. It was very, very unique. Like, I don't really want to see a Bray Wyatt seen a match again and we've seen that we've seen that many times but the mm-hmm. fact they were able to do a completely different take on this it's crazy and nobody was expecting this in the, in the world this year in, like nobody even knew what was going on until you were kind of halfway through and you're like oh this is what they're doing but, i didn't even know if the match started or anything i was like is this is this is this the promo have we started them oh he's getting pinned <laughs> like <laughs> i'll be honest with you when Cena came out in the performance center. I was disappointed. Because I'm like, oh, it's just going to be a match. And when I hear that kind of stuff, my my my, my TNA trauma kicks in. And mm. I'm like, oh God, it's going to be like the, the fun house match or something like this, you know? Right, right. Hard cuts <laughs> to, you know, hard cuts to Bray Wyatt. And you're like, oh, wait, wait, no, we're, we're going somewhere else. And I was just, this is brilliant. Now, I was listening to the Observer before we recorded, and uh, they were saying that, oh, it was disappointing that they didn't, you know, tell us that it was going to be this kind of match, and they were expecting a wrestling match. I'm like, no, you know, it's, you know, have some fun, you know. It's like, it was a fun match. And it, look, this is another thing that people are going to talk about for years. For years, you know. We got an NWO Nitro, an NWO Nitro reference. People don't even remember there was an NWO Nitro, <laughs> and, and that they had two factions. They had the you know the Wolfpack. They had the OG. You know the red and the yeah. white. I, I super like, appreciated. I couldn't believe that. I was like, wow, we're going back. Also, there was a CM Punk chant at a main event at WrestleMania. 
they they acknowledged mm-hmm. it. They start they uh, doing job jobs. Uh, Vince, you know, right. another great like, failing of like, Cena's that they brought up. I, I love that. It was it was incredible. Like it had absolutely everything. Now was it the best wrestling match in the world? No, because it wasn't a wrestling match. But it what it you know it wasn't trying but, to be. It was trying but, to be this psychological character for the. Was it the best sports entertainment match? Exactly. I would say, yeah. And I'm not even going to comment on what those other guys said, because I don't care. I don't listen to other people's opinions. I form my own. And I, I, especially when I know I'm going to be doing a show and talking about things, I don't want that. It's the same way when I used to recap Raw and do shows on that. If I read other people's writings, I don't want that to influence my own opinions. So I just... Push it to the side. That's right. Whatever. If the, sorry, this isn't what you wanted. How about you be happy you got anything in the first place? Like you're not fooling us that you weren't going to watch it. So whatever. Grow up. Yeah. You're seventy years old. It's Grow up. <laughs> but when I hear that, right? I when I hear that kind of that kind of talk, kind of, I'm like, if it had just been an empty arena match, a straight rest of the match, that would have been boring. That would have been terrible. Doing this is unlike anything that we have ever got. And it's also what like the whole Matt Hardy thing that they were trying to do where they you know where they had these kind of story cinematic story, uh, matches. It was, you know, it, it they've been building for a while and they'll be finally figuring out how to do it. Like we had this Bray Wyatt uh fiend thing. This is what they've wanted to do from the beginning and it failed in Hell in a Cell because it was shot live and it was a match. They figured out how to do it purely by accident or just but by necessity. And also, one thing I do have to say, if you play 2K20, they predict this. They predict a lot of this just by how crazy that, uh, yeah, literally. I, really? I've been streaming it because I couldn't believe it. Yeah, the actual, like, met my player career mode, you fight the Undertaker in hell for some reason. Um, Bray Wyatt shows up and you fight him in a haunted house. And it's, they, they, they went crazy because that is a broken game, but they decided to throw in a crazy <laughs> career mode to make up for it. Right? And I'm just like, the same thing happened there. Necessity is the mother of invention. But also, there's a hell of a lot of empty arena matches in 2K20 for some reason. Maybe they Which were predicting weird. the future, like you're saying. Maybe they yeah. saw it coming. Yeah, or... I don't know. Or, or conspiracies. <laughs> <laughs> hey, or maybe they're just yeah, capitalizing on great ideas from other mediums, because why shouldn't you in this instance? Uh... What, what I just oh, that match is gonna stick with me for a really long time, I think that and the boneyard match. Um, but but it surpassed the boneyard match, I didn't even think that was possible because I'm such you know, I'm such a mark for this dude, I didn't think I'd be able to, but they blew me away. And I, I, I've harked on the different aspects of the psychology behind it, but it was, I, I one thing that I thought was really clever, and there's no way they could have plan this out i guess they did and they were just going to use it in the promo and it just kind of worked out but bray using the exact same line that kurt angle did to call out cena for his debut performance that was brilliant when's the last time wwe has even put those those segments into motion it's been uh, it's been years since they've booked that far in advance so that that also blew my mind but, uh, but also him being Eric Bischoff. Yes. And, 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 you know, reacting that, like, that's crazy. Like, what? never, never does WWE even acknowledge that WCW was a thing. Never mind reenacting it. It's incredible. Like, this was amazing. This was the best thing I've ever seen in wrestling in my life. <laughs> it, it, it's just because they actually managed to completely break a mold. And it not be terrible. TNA have tried this and it was awful. WWE have tried it and it's awful. They just figured out, hey, you just give this time and let the guys do it. Because I know, obviously, Cena and Bray can do what they want. And this is what they want to do. And it's spectacular. They took two guys with great character and let me play uh, devil's advocate or corporate advocate. Because what's really the difference uh, for a moment here? At the very least, what this match did to people who maybe signed up for their you know, free month of the WWE Network, they showed you every era, basically, of wrestling that these guys have been in, that 
other guys have been in. So maybe it'll keep your attention. You'll sign up for another month to go, hey, what is that whole NWO thing? I'm going to go check out episodes. I've never heard of Nitro. I'll check that out. Oh, early SmackDown. Yeah, Cena used yeah, to look absolutely. like that. What's this rapping? It was, it, it was not only a great sports entertainment match, a great psychology uh, lesson. It was also great advertising. It was a fantastic commercial. And I, I can't believe WWE have, in, in the age of like connected universes, WWE by purchase have one of the largest connected universes that exists. And to do these kind of matches, you can actually put yourself in these, in these, um, elements without them being lame, like they would in other WWE video games. You know, where you have like the NWO gets back together and evades and it always comes off kind of hammy. This didn't yeah. because it's like, well, it's not real. It's a psychological journey, which is insane when you think about it. But look, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely Undertaker. insane. It's the same when you think. That's why I loved it. Undead... Oh yeah, but look, the Undertaker is an undead wizard. So he teleported. Like, the Taker teleported yeah. for crying out loud. Exactly. Yeah. Look, we we have we have precedent for this. So if the Undertaker can do that, why can't Bray Wyatt? invoke a psychological exploration through and if actually if you look at it right did you notice what was written on the door before the way into um the way into the punt out put out uh all ye who enter here shall perish or something like that abandon all hope ye who and exit here but it's supposed to be who enter here that's from Dante's Inferno. Oh right. oh that's brilliant and oh. Dante Zaverno's journey through hell. Through right, the seven levels. state. Oh. Were there seven different Cenas? Uh, no, but like there were different levels. So there's nine levels of hell. And um, well, that's what they were doing. Bray Wyatt was guiding him through his lowest moments. And that was the story. Right. I, I'm just so wondering now, amazing. taking it to that point, if there were seven different aspects of Cena that we saw to go along with that motif. Because that could have been. That. Five twenty thousand stars, like Mario just gained a thousand extra lives. <laughs> That's how many coins he collected. <laughs> but see, the, uh, this is there was, and I think people are missing it. It's like they literally told you what they were going to do, and you know, if you weren't putting that together, that's on you. You know, there was very little hand holding here, and I think that's something that we have missed for years because it's been so spoon fed and corporatized and terrible. Now something completely wild. Go for it. And I think it's very polarizing, but the people who don't get it, I understand why you don't get it, but I think this and the Bonier match, this is this is wrestling, you know, right now. This is professional wrestling. It's it's sports entertainment. Like even AEW, the great AEW that everybody loves. My Hardy teleported this week. There you go. Arena. It's like, come on, like <laughs> The best thing about <laughs> <laughs> the what best thing about AEW right now is Chris Jericho versus Vanguard One. Oh yeah, but even still, if you follow him on Twitter, too, it's fantastic, oh, it's brilliant. But that kind of stuff too, you know, it's like this is where wrestling is going. Instagram. Not yeah. not only because of necessity, but also because we it's grown out of just being two guys in the ring because that's very boring after a while. Unless you're having an amazing match, but how often are you going to have amazing matches? You're not. Well, here's something really bizarre, and. The chat might never want me on this show again for saying it, but um, I'm one of those few people that actually read Vince Russo's book. And one of the things that he talks about, yeah, one of the things he talked about in there that always struck me um, as very poignant was that he had conversations with Vince about how really you're always going to have your hardcore wrestling fans. It's about attracting in the casual fans and wrestling is becoming more and more about drama. And they would joke to each other about how one day you wouldn't even need a ring. It would just be the drama that brought people to watch it. And we just yeah. main evented two separate nights of WrestleMania without a no. ring. Vince Russo was right. And those were the matches we're ecstatic about. But that's the thing. Who wrote the attitude there? Vince Russo wrote the attitude there. Yep. And this is it. We're back. We're back. We've been around. Yeah. And leading into this, it's like, this is how you do it. This is the, the, the magic that was missing for so long. So look, we've reached our time. 
But Dave, we could talk about this all night. <laughs> We're not <laughs> going to. But um, thanks so much for joining us, dude. I'm ecstatic that you're a host on this show. Um, yeah, really absolutely. So I look forward to doing it again. I. Why not? We have, we have to find out uh, how, how we're going to do this. What's going to happen next week or two? But look, you know, we have the network, so we might even go back and have a look at some classic shows. If that's the there you go. In the meantime, uh, um, I'm going to cheap plugs. Can I cheap plug myself? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. yeah. yeah go for it. Um, don't worry about Twitter. I never post there. But follow my Instagram, uh, the Dave Stevens, spelled the same way it is on my little name card there. Just Dave instead of David, the Dave Stevens. Um, it's mostly videos of me juggling. But hey. We need, all need to be entertained during this time. So follow me there. Exactly. Um, you could tweet me. I do read and check. I just don't tend to send out my own tweets. And that's the same tag, the Dave Stevens. So awesome, awesome guys. And yeah, we'll have this up on nerdsnowmedia.com. Um, until next week, it's been the Wrestling Rewind. Talk to you then.